you are here. You, the worship was so sweet. Communing with you, taking communion and having being able to give and listen to all the things that are going on. It's so wonderful to be in your presence. I pray today that through your word that you would speak to every one of your children here, God. Um, sometimes your word is is so nice and and encouraging, and then sometimes your word like cuts us open a little bit and it challenges us. And and God, I pray that each one of us would be challenged here in a in a in a in a way that n- we would feel um, compelled to not let ourselves leave here the same way that we showed up. And so, God, um, get a hold of our hearts, get a hold of our lives. Um, let us hear clearly from you. And Lord, I pray that you would allow Rebecca to decrease and the Holy Spirit to increase. Speak through me this morning. I avail my whole self to you, body, soul, and spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, what are you wearing? I've always liked clothes that make a statement. Okay? Um, I like to think that I, I have a, maybe a distinct personal style. While I refuse to obsess about my looks, I, I may have done that, like maybe in my teens and 20s, I was very, very concerned about how I, you know, presented. Um, I, I also, I want to be a woman um, that has some dignity and presents with some some order, you know. I think all of us feel that way. Okay, um, I I think I'm probably dead center in the appearance scale, like right down the middle, somewhere between slob and diva, just maybe like <laughs> dead in the center. Okay, <laughs> um, I think that it's actually pretty infrequent um, to find a human who truly does not care about how they appear. Wouldn't you agree with that statement? Every once in a while, you meet a person who just doesn't care. They roll out of bed. Their hair is going every which way. It doesn't matter if they've showered. It doesn't matter what they have on. They just don't care. And you know what? More power to them. (laughs) Some people are just fine about that. But I would say that probably most humans give somewhat of care into how we present. I look around here, and I see each of you presenting very nicely this morning. And um, so (laughs) not many of us have time or money to shop on a regular basis. Anybody here have time and excess money that they can just kind of go shopping whenever they want? Lenny, oh boy. (laughs) All right. I don't I don't have the time or money. I just bought this gray shirt on Amazon with a click. You know, I just I don't have time. But um it 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 takes like effort to have just precisely the right statement pieces in your wardrobe. Um but I I have only ever met a few people who simply um just don't don't care anything. Safely we can look at ourselves and at each other and gather that most humans give a small amount of effort into presenting nicely on a daily basis. We wash our clothes, we fold them, we iron them, and we carefully select pieces that represent our personal sense of style and comfort or taste. My tastes and and sense of style has morphed quite a bit over the years. Um, Before we went into full-time ministry, before I went into full-time ministry, Um, I was a wedding and event planner, and I had to dress differently than I dress now. I was a wedding and event planner on the East Coast, so I had to dress much more professionally. Um, And since moving back to California, my style has relaxed quite a bit. I reconnected with more of my kind of SoCal bohemian style. Um, uh, Sean calls it hippie. but. I, I don't, I ignore that. <laughs> and since this pandemic started, I actually, I'm going to make a confession here this morning. I've only put on one pair of jeans since the pandemic started, okay? I put a pair of jeans on, oh, maybe about four or five months into the pandemic, 
because we were all at home just constantly. And um, I put on this pair of jeans and literally my body threw a temper tantrum. And I had to go home and take the jeans off. And I just went, they're still in my closet. I still have them. I didn't get rid of them, but I don't know if I'm ever going to put them on again. Okay. <laughs> Is that silly? Um, I'm resigned to wearing leggings until Jesus comes back. <laughs> and I'm proud of that. Okay. <laughs> um, but when I look around, Corwin, Corwin's not here, but Corwin likes boots and jeans. And sometimes you'll catch him in a hat. He's got a bit of a country boy thing going on. I love that, you know. Um, and then uh, Andrew, Andrew wears his witnessing t-shirts, his jeans. And typically you can find Andrew with a couple thick Italian chains around his neck. He's got this East Coast kind of... Um, what it, what would I write down here? An East Coast, yeah, kind of like New York thing going. A little bit of a Guido. His hair is always cut really, really. It's, he takes very, very, a, a lot of care with how he cuts his hair. I love that about him, okay? And his eyebrows, okay? <laughs> don't, don't conf <laughs> This is going on the internet, okay? Don't confess that. <laughs> And then, um, oh, see, there's nothing wrong with Andrew's style. Forget about it, you know, okay? And then there's Luna, who's not here with us today. He's got, like, this skinny jeans, Latin kind of hipster thing going on. And I'm like, I can't figure out exactly, but he's got his own style. And then there's Matt. <laughs> Matthew. <laughs> I love Matthew. And Matthew, he's kind of got his, you know, his signature sweaters, tank tops, head wrap, and ha hat combo. He's our resident gypsy pirate, <laughs> okay? And then the scarf. You can't forget the scarf. Matt's always got the scarf, you know? I love it. It wouldn't be Matthew without the scarf. All the clothes that we wear make a statement about the kind of person we are or the kind of person we think we are or the kind of person that we want other people to think we are, right? Okay? And other people will, like it or not, they're going to make a judgment based upon our appearance, and in particular, based on what we're wearing. They kind of make a judgment on us. Um, have, has anybody here ever been guilty of that? I have, where I meet a person, and I have judged them based on what they were wearing. And I am pray praying that God rids me of that. I've gotten much better about that over the years. But we get these impressions of people, how they present. Oftentimes, you, uh, uh, you can't read a book by its cover, right? There's a lot more to a person than just what they're wearing. Um. So your clothes give a great deal of information, however, about you to other people and probably also say a great deal about how you want to appear or perhaps you don't even think about what to wear when you get dressed and just throw on what's in the dirty clothes hamper <laughs> or on the floor, um, which in and of itself, that also gives an impression, right? So we're going to open up the word today. If you guys could pop up that slide to Colossians 3, starting in verse 5. And the word of God reads, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived before Christ. But now, after becoming a follower of Jesus, I inserted that in there, you must also rid yourselves of such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self. Did you catch that? You've taken off your old self and its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge 
of the image of its creator. Lord, let your word make a deep impression in us today. In this scripture passage, the Apostle Paul is likening our old nature and current sin struggles to clothing. It's kind of cool how he does that. He, he actually is really good at this. He uses word pictures all the way through the New Testament. And um, I love that. I, I think it's great. It's a great way to teach is when we use illustrations or, or similes. We liken something to something else that makes it similar, makes it easier for us to understand. He gives a list of things that we might call big, ugly sins. Okay, that first list in that scripture, they're like big, ugly, visible. You're not going to miss those. A lot of times um, you, you are around a person who's struggling with, th- with those things and it's obvious. Okay, or, or maybe you've struggled or I've struggled with those things in the past. Those sins are hard to hide. Okay, and then... Um, oh, the, the list the list is this, immorality, lust, greed, which is the love of money. And these are things that controlled many of us before we came to know Jesus. And I'm wondering if Paul wrote this list as the big whoppers, the stuff that's visible and the stuff that Jesus tends to deal with kind of immediately. When we first come to Jesus, oftentimes the big visible things are the things that he goes in and starts, he's, he points out right away. And it's the things that when we walk in the room, they're visible enough that they're kind of slapping other people around. <laughs> I had I had l- quite a few of those when I came to Jesus. And, and God was faithful to deal with me pretty swiftly about some big whoppers in my life. But there's a second list in this scripture. Um, Hang on a second. But quite skillfully, Paul crafts a secondary list of sins that some might consider to be a lesser list. But these are indeed practices that can follow us into our Christianity. Have you ever hung out with a Jesus follower and get shocked by the language that's slipping out of their mouth? They're like, whoa. Whoa, <laughs> dropping some bombs. Or, or they're busy gossiping about other people in the church. It happens sometimes. Or maybe you slip up in a lie or you tell an untruth. And, and this is in the second list of sins. And I, I don't think there are any greater or lesser. I just think that sometimes God be deals with the big ones first, the big obvious ones first, and then kind of the ones that are a little bit more covert. He goes in second. He goes in next for kind of the ones that we can maybe a little bit more easily hide. Paul instructs us to take off our old selves. When we come to Jesus, we are dressed, but our clothes are stinky, ragged, and worn out. There, we are covered in dirty laundry. Anybody here come to Jesus like that? I did. I was wearing yuck, yuck, yuck clothes spiritually. Okay. Um, what do you do when you wear a set of clothes all day, and maybe even for a few days, and you get sweaty and funky, <laughs> and you do your housework in these clothes, or maybe you go change the oil? In these clothes, Um, maybe you pulled weeds in the garden. You came in and maybe did a workout, you know, at at home since the pandemic. We're all hopefully working out at home. (laughs) But yuck, what happens to your clothes after doing all this kind of work? They stink. They're yucky. And we, what do we do when we get nasty like this? We take off the funky clothes, take a shower. Okay, and we get nice and clean. Salvation is this cleansing that happens. We get clean. Um, But this morning's teaching is not about physical clothes. 
This morning, we're being asked by the Apostle Paul and the Holy Spirit, who inspired Paul to write this scripture, to think about what our spiritual clothes look like. What are you wearing this morning? Paul wrote this letter that we're reading to a church community in Colossae, okay? The Colossians, that's Colossians are people, the residents who lived in the town of Colossae, a small town in Asia Minor. Today we know this area as modern day Turkey, which someday I hope to visit and swim in the turquoise waters of the coast. Has anybody ever been to the turquoise coast of Turkey? Oh my gosh, okay, I've seen the movies, I've seen the video, it's like I'm totally jealous in, in a good way, okay? <laughs> Um, but I have dreamed of going there because the, the waters are just exquisitely beautiful. And um, anyways, bucket list, okay? And um, so Colossae was about 100 miles from the large metropolitan city of Ephesus. One of the reasons that Paul sent the letter was that he was wanting to address the problem of certain teachers who were spreading false teaching within the congregation of Colossae, the Colossian church. In the first part of the letter, he addresses some matters of very important doctrine. Paul explains how Christ is the firstborn of all creation. Everything has been created through him and for him. God has chosen for his complete being to dwell in Christ. Oh, my gosh. We could spend all day just talking about that. But today we're talking about clothes, okay? And um, everything has been created through him and for him. What's important for us to grasp this morning is summed up in Colossians 1, 13, and 14. It's kind of a little summary of this teaching of very important doctrine. It says, for he has rescued from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. That's the gospel in a nutshell. I love that verse. For the Christians at Colossae and all, and for all the rest of us Jesus followers everywhere for all times because the Bible was written for them then and for all of us to come, right? And here at Real Life Church, we believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, that it it was penned at the hand of man, but it was inspired through the Holy Spirit. And we believe that, that the Bible is truly God's word to us, and we can hang on every word, every word the bible's the bible itself says that it's living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword it's not just ink and paper words on a page if you read these books they're they're alive and they're spiritual and they have the power and the potential to get inside of us to divide us in our body in our soul in our to get all the way into our spirit and change things okay if you need a change Open the Bible and start reading it. (laughs) Okay, that's another sermon. (laughs) Let's get back to this one, okay? Um, In the second, um, oh, okay, for for the Christians at Colossae, um, it meant that there were and are standards of behavior and that we are now expected to uphold these as Jesus followers. A lot of churches, um, they avoid using words like this, like a standard of behavior or expectations that are now upon you that you've bought into this gospel. God loved you enough to change you, to not leave you in the same condition, in the same stinky, nasty clothes that you were wearing. But but so many Christians just want to camp out in the love. Oh, in the love. But there's, there's, there's work that goes into this. We have to put, there's skin in the game for us. Okay? Jesus did the greatest work on the cross. We're not saved by works. But we've got to buy into this. And there are, are expectations 
on us as followers of Christ. In the second part of the letter where we picked up in our scripture reading this morning, Paul writes at great length about these standards of Christian behavior. He begins by addressing the sins that were part of the former life, the things that we've been delivered from, or maybe some of us are still in the process of deliverance. And and wherever you are today, that's okay. You're in a safe place. There's no judgment here because we're all in process. Some of us may be a little further along than others, but we're all in this process of Jesus transforming us from the inside out. The anger, the wrath, the malice, slander, foul language, these things we must now get rid of. God is asking for these things from us. As followers of Christ, we are new creations, and there is no room in our lives for us to continue in these old, sinful habits, these stinky, yucky garments. It's time for them to go. How many of you here have taken off the old, stinky robes? (laughs) That was a shout out to Luna, okay? He's not even here today, and I'm giving him some Nacho Libre quotes, <laughs> right? Um, the, the stinky robes from your old life. So then what? If we've taken the old things off, and we've been bathed and cleaned up and healed by salvation through Jesus, then what do we do next? We stand around naked? Nope. Nope, it's time to get dressed. We're going to talk about what we're supposed to get dressed in. We're going to read on. In Colossians 3, 12, they're going to put the scripture up on the screen. Since, you guys got it? There it is. Colossians 3, 12 to 14. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Mm. I like this scripture. This is the one that makes, oh, we go, oh, this is nice. This feels good. This is hard. This is where the work comes in. This is where we have to take Jesus by the hand and say, God, change me. I'm putting my skin in the game here. We've got to apply ourselves because these kinds of attributes don't come naturally to those of us who have sin natures. And last time I checked, all of us have sin natures, okay? Every human that's walked this planet. Mm, Did you catch that in this passage? Instead of a list of funky clothes to take off, Paul is instructing us what to put on and to get dressed in. I love this. It's that word picture that's so helpful. Um, These are some pretty special articles that he's mentioned. And I want to share with you from my stash today, I brought along um, some important articles of clothing today. And um, when I preach, I like to have things to look at because I feel like um, it helps us to retain more information. Andrew, could you help me move that chair? Thank God for interns. Thank you, Andrew. You bless me. Just put it right there, okay? And I've got my suitcase here. And I wheeled my suitcase up this morning. And someone was like, are you leaving us? I was like, no, 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 not leaving. Okay? So I have my suitcase here. It's all packed. It's packed with some stuff that I'm going to share with you today, okay? So first article, tender-hearted mercy. And I have chosen to depict tender-hearted mercy with this. This is a pair of socks. <laughs> and when I think of tender-hearted mercy, I think about compassion. Compassion. And can, can we put that the, the first tender-hearted mercy and compassion? Um, 
I have had some wonderful opportunities recently to, hang on one second. All right, I'm giving, giving the guy a little lesson there. Okay, so compassion. <laughs> um, sometimes when we go out onto the streets, there's a lot of homeless people in San Diego, um, mostly because the weather is mild enough that people can feasibly live outside all year long. This year it's been a little cold. We've had a lot of overcast gray dreary weather. I can imagine it's been cold, but we pass out a lot of socks to homeless people. And when I look at socks, I think about going out on the streets and ministering to people who have nothing. And I think about the compassion of Christ, tender, loving mercy, tender-hearted mercy. And the definition of of tender-hearted mercy or compassion is this. It's sympathetic concern for the sufferings or misfortunes of others. We're supposed to put it on. We're supposed to put these articles on. Tender-hearted mercy, where we can look at somebody and see their plight, see their struggle, see their pain visibly on them. And it doesn't need to be a homeless person, although that's obvious. Sometimes we run into each other even in the church or people that we work with or family members or neighbors, and they are going through a lot of things that are a lot of struggle. And we need to have compassion and tender-hearted mercy for people in the world and even more so for each other in the church. Does anybody agree with that statement? Tender-hearted mercy. And I want to read this scripture. Don't forget your socks, okay? I want to read this scripture, Matthew 25, 37 to 40. And this is such a beautiful depiction um, it's of tender-hearted mercy. It says, then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for the one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. <laughs> so when we show tender-hearted mercy and compassion for people, it's as if we're ministering right to Jesus. When we give a cup of warm soup or cocoa or a pair of socks or a toothbrush, it's like handing that to Jesus. If you saw Jesus standing there, we'd all be gathering around. But ministering to these lost sheep is just like ministering to our Savior. Hmm. Tender-hearted mercy, okay? Next one, next attribute that Paul lists is kindness. The definition of kindness is the quality of being friendly, generous, and considerate. That's kindness. Somebody who, um, um, like, opens a car door. I was with Craig and Nicole last night, and he was opening the car door for me. I was like, that was really kind. Um, I brought a scarf today to represent kindness. Um, and kindness is just something that kind of, like, wraps around you, and it's, like, comfortable. And when we show kindness to each other and to the world, it's an attractant. It's an attractant. It's easy to be unkind. I want to tell you that. It's easy to be unkind. Like, when um, I'm at the grocery store and somebody runs over my foot with a grocery cart or runs into me, I was at shopping at Food for Less, and this little abuelita, she, like, <laughs> hit me with her cart, said some things in Spanish. I was like, oh, I understand that. <laughs> it wasn't kind. And I, like, something inside of me was just, like, <coughs> I wanted to just, like, bite back. You know, every, anybody ever feel that way? Okay. No, Letty, Letty says no. I don't believe that. Okay. <laughs> I feel that way. But kindness is something that we have to put on. 
kindness is, is a response that we choose to give out. And it's not, it's, it's not a conditional thing as a Jesus follower. We're supposed to be giving out kindness even when it's seemingly undeserved. Even when another response would, would be expected from people in the world. But we don't live according to the world's standards. We live according to God's standards. So kindness, kindness is something that we need to be putting on. And the scripture that I, I um, picked to depict kindness is Ephesians 4, 31 to 32. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, there's that word again, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Put others' needs in front of your own. That's kindness. Considering other people before you consider yourself. Okay? Any, anybody feeling convicted this morning? I am. I need to be putting on my scarf of kindness and my socks of compassion. Okay? Working on it, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for your word, Lord. Next, next attribute is humility. And the definition of humility is a modest or low view of one's own importance. This is good. A modest or low view of one's own importance. And the article that I chose to depict humility is an apron. It's an apron. And when somebody's wearing an apron, what does that usually indicate? That they're serving maybe food or working in the garage or like when somebody's got like a smock or coveralls or an apron on, it usually indicates that they're doing something messy. And this, this, I, I actually love this apron. This is an apron. It says, um, what does it say on it? I am love. She is loved. Um, and my husband bought this apron for me, but then I gave it as a gift to Jerlene um, because she's been this incredible mother to her kids and she's very loved. Um, but I want to be the kind of person um, that doesn't think too lofty of myself. It's a pride killer to walk in humility. It's a pride killer to put on an apron and serve others. It's a pride killer. And as followers of Christ, we need to be crucifying our pride all the time. And the opposite of pride is humility. Hmm. I'm feeling convicted this morning. So the scripture that I picked to depict humility is 1 Peter 5.5. 5. In the same way, you who are younger must accept the authority of the elders. And all of you, here it is, dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Oh, my gosh. I need God's grace so bad. Can you imagine being proud, being proud and God opposing you? The God of the universe opposing you because of your pride. I need his grace so desperately. And so, Lord, let humility be something that we put on all the time. Okay? Mm. Next attribute. Gentleness. This is one I've really struggled with. When I first came to Jesus, you could call me anything but gentle. I was kind of a bull in China closet. And uh, loud and proud and in charge and a, little, a lot controlling. And uh, gentle was definitely not a word that you would use to describe me. Um, the definition of gentleness is mild in manner or disposition. Have you ever met somebody who's gentle? Think about somebody in your life who's gentle. The article of clothing 
that I picked to de depict gentleness is a pair of nice, soft gloves. It's like, it's this soft touch. Somebody who's very gentle. And their words are gentle. This used to be something that I worked when I was a women's home director of a recovery home. I worked with my girls a lot on gentleness. Because women struggle with this. <laughs> I think we all do as humans and sinners. But gentleness, mild in manner or disposition. Sometimes it sometimes some holy force and passion is necessary. But gentleness is a really, really important attribute. There are so many things that are easy, so many words that are easy to take in from somebody who's saying them in a gentle way. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. I've had leaders in my life who came in and were not gentle with me. They <laughs> cut me all up and down. I left bleeding. I learned some things, some good and some bad things. But the, the leaders in my life who've come in and been really gentle with me, it's so much easier for me to receive their words. It like it's like goes down with a spoonful of sugar. Okay, Mary Poppins, gentle, gentle gloves. Let's have a, a soft touch as Jesus followers. The scripture I actually picked two scriptures. Proverbs sixteen twenty four says, "Gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones." I love that scripture. Proverbs 15, 1 says, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. I have had to, oh my gosh, discipline my children numerous times. And I, you know, like, I want to go in and be like, <laughs> but I go in and I just gently and calmly say, nope, sit down, listen to what I have to say. And I deliver it to him in a gentle way, and it goes down much better, okay? Gentleness. Working on that one. Next, next characteristic is patience. Oh, boy. Here we go. Here's the one that most of us struggle with. <laughs> patience. The definition of patience is the capacity to accept or tolerate delay trouble or suffering without getting upset or angry. Patience requires us to lower our expectations of everybody else but ourselves. It increases our capacity. And so the article of clothing that I chose to depict patience is stretchy pants. <laughs> These are our classic pandemic wear, okay, and there's a lot of give to them, all right? Stretchy pants, sweat pants, increasing our capacity. We put these on after Thanksgiving dinner, right? <laughs> or maybe before. We Increasing our capacity, lowering our expectations, uh, extending grace. A lot of times grace comes with patience. Um, the, the scripture that I chose to um, depict patience is Proverbs fifteen eighteen. A hot-tempered person stirs up conflict, but the one who is patient calms a quarrel. Mm. I remember um, there was a time in my life that I was praying for patience. I was a, I was a young mom, and I had five kids. By the time I was 25 years old, I had five children. Gave birth to three of them and had taken on my other two to raise. And I was stretched to capacity almost on a daily basis. I had an, like a person that doesn't have patience. They kind of remind me of like a rubber band that's about to go pop. <laughs> and um, I remember my husband shared with me he said, um, you know, sitting at the train tracks, there used to be a set of train tracks by our house. And it seemed like 
the train gate always dropped as we were driving up, always. And he began to minister to me about, it's like, when we pray for patience, God's going to allow those train track things to drop every time. When we pray for patience, God's going to test us. If we need to grow in patience, then expect delays. Expect those things and then ask the Holy Spirit to give you grace. Ask the Holy Spirit to put, help you put on your stretchy pants. Okay? Anybody here need to work on patience? I know I do. Okay? Um, no, I'm not going to do the Nacho Libre st stretchy pants stance today. No. If Luna was here, I'd probably do it, but I'm not doing it. He's not here. <laughs> so we're rounding the corner here. The next, the la or next to the last thing that the Apostle Paul addresses is forgiveness. Forgiveness. The definition of forgiveness is releasing the other from blame, leaving the event in God's hands to deal with and moving forward without record. Ooh like a complete release of a wrong, of a wrongdoing, of a, an offense, whatever it is. Um, unforgiveness is a choice. It's a choice that we make. When we hold on to things, we choose that. We can choose to release things. Sometimes people who really struggle with forgiveness, it's not something I, I struggle with. Uh, that's one thing on this list that comes easy for me. Thank God there's one, okay? <laughs> But people are like, how do you do that? I'm like, I don't know. I just, I just let go. And I trust them to God. And I don't hold things against them. Move forward. So the article of clothing that I chose to, to um, depict forgiveness is a raincoat. And there's a reason. Um, because um, in in Early in my walk with Jesus, I struggled extremely with picking up offenses. I haven't always been good at forgiveness. But it was, I was sensitive and kind of quick to become offended at people. And the Lord, and, and I went to the Lord one time I was struggling. I was like, God, why did you make me like this? Because actually I had somebody in my life who was telling me, you're way too sensitive. You need to change. You need to toughen up. You need to wear your armor all the time. And there was some truth in that. But what this person was trying to tell me was that I needed to change. And I went before the Lord and I said, could you change me? Can I don't want to be so sensitive. And I remember on my, on my knees in front of the Lord, he said to me that day, he said, Rebecca, I made you just the way I need you. I gave you a sensitive heart for a reason. But I need you to learn how to live in this world with a sensitive heart. You just need to put on a raincoat. Put a rain jacket on your heart. Protect your heart. Guard your heart because it's the wellspring of life. That's a scripture, right? <laughs> Guard your heart. Protect it from the rain. But keep your sensitive heart. And so I've learned to do that. I've learned to be very quick to forgive, but it's because I've got a slicker on my sensitive heart. The scripture that I chose is Mark eleven twenty five. 25. It says, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your father in heaven may forgive your sins. Is anybody here in need of forgiveness of your sins? Oh, my goodness, me. So in my estimation, as I read this scripture, None of us can afford unforgiveness. Our, the, the amount that the Heavenly Father forgives us, if it's based on how we forgive other people, then we better be quick to forgive. Put that slicker on your heart. Protect your heart. Don't pick up offenses. Be quick to release those things. Okay? Put, put on your raincoat. <laughs> hmm. And last but not least, um, I want to talk about love. 
And Paul addressed love in the last portion of that scripture. And love is actually a hard thing to describe because it's very, very all-encompassing. And I've say, I say this often, if you boiled down the New Testament, boiled it down, reduced it, reduced it, reduced it to one word, it would be this, love. God's love for us. <laughs> and, and we love him because he first loved us. But the, the article of clothing that I chose to depict, see, I've got a whole bag of tricks up here, is this sweater. And Matthew lovingly loaned me one of his sweaters. But this soft, this soft fuzzy sweater, okay, it's like a hug. This is a, this is a colorful, loud hug. <laughs> That's right. Nothing like a cardigan, right? A soft, fuzzy sweater. That's what I thought about when I thought of love. The definition of love is this, unconditional partiality. Partiality that has no strings attached. There's nothing that you could do to earn it or cancel it out. That's powerful. That's how God loves you. And that's how we're supposed to love each other. No matter what you do, no matter what you say, I'm going to love you. It's our commitment to each other as the family of God. And not only that, it shows the world that we're legit. The Bible says that they will know that you are Christians by your love. And it's not talking about your love for your dog or even your love for your children. It's how you love each other in the church. That's what that scripture means. They're going to know you're Christians by the way you love each other. That's heavy. And I, and I like to think that we've got a, a pretty good head start here at Real Life Church on, on love. That if you hang around here long enough, you're going to feel it. Sometimes love is a warm bowl of pozole verde. <laughs> Sometimes love is a hug. Sometimes love is a little gift or a warm cup of tea when you're coughing bottle of water. Sometimes love is an encouragement. Occasionally lo a love is a swift kick in the pants. <laughs> Sometimes love is correction. But correction done in love is the most important thing. These are th this is everything that we do at Real Life Church needs to be based in love always. It should be the motivation behind every word, every song, Every dollar, every outreach, everything that we do here, every meeting, <laughs> every moment we spend with each other and in, God, in God's presence should be motivated by love. And this is the scripture that I want to pick, two scriptures. Psalm 143.8, I love this scripture. I'm a person that loves love. It says, let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love. God's love is unfailing for us. It's unconditional. For I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go. For to you I entrust my life. And then 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, and now these three things remain. He just gave this big old long list of all the things that love is. It's patient and kind and you know, the, the, the love chapter. They, they read it at almost every wedding. But at the end, Paul boils it down. And he says, but these three things remain. Hope, faith, and love. But the greatest is what? Love. It's the greatest attribute. It's the best thing that we have to offer to each other, to a broken world, and to Jesus. Because what else do we have to give him but our love and our devotion? As we were singing that song this morning, our affection and our devotion, all of our love, we pour out on the feet of Jesus. It's a beautiful offering to him. So what are you wearing today? The Christians at Colossae were no different than the Christians in any other time or place throughout history. With that in mind, real life church is just like the church at Colossae. 
in their minds and in ours, we are quite suitably dressed. But Paul is asking all of us to give pause. And he's saying we need to choose our spiritual clothes carefully, for only certain clothes will do for a Jesus follower. There are certain things we just don't need to be wearing anymore and certain articles of clothing that we need to be putting on every single day. And it's not just a once-and-done thing. These things leak. (laughs) We have to put them on every day. These are choices that we make every day to put these articles on again, again. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to humbly serve again. I'm going to be patient again. The challenge that Paul gives us is to take a step back and think about how we appear to others, both inside and outside of the church. When others look at how you're dressed, what do they see? Do they see a man or woman of dignity dressed appropriately as a follower of Christ? Or or are you hanging on to the old and funky clothes from your past life? Essentially, when they look at you, do they see Jesus? The way when we dress ourselves in patience and humility and kindness and compassion and love, then we look like Jesus. Because those are all of the qualities that, that the Son of God embodied when he walked on this earth. And he's our greatest example. Once in a while, it's good to take a good long look in the mirror to inspect how we are dressed. I'll tell you the best way to look in the mirror spiritually is to be committed to reading the word of God every single day. This book acts as a mirror, showing us what is right, what is wrong, what is beautiful, and what is ugly about ourselves. We also need to be sitting before the Lord in prayer on a regular basis, holding ourselves before him, asking him to reveal the yucky garments that we're hanging on to and showing us how to put the clean array on that the Holy Spirit is committed to showing us how to wear well. The thing is, is you're not in this alone. It does take commitment on your behalf, but we have the help of the Holy Spirit when we're in the word, when we're in prayer, the Holy Spirit's there. He's like, here, step into this. Let me help you put this on. <laughs> and he holds it as we slide our arm in or put our feet in. He's there to help. Sometimes how we think we appear isn't perhaps what others see. It's also very easy to become the kind of person that is always checking out what other people are wearing and judging them based on their spiritual wardrobe. Well, they don't seem to be clothed with much compassion or kindness or patience and so on. Instead of concerning ourselves what everyone else is wearing in the spiritual sense that Paul is talking about, we regularly need to be looking in the mirror and asking, how am I dressed? Am I clothed with love and compassion and kindness? Don't be worried about everybody else. Be worried about you. Because one day when you stand before Jesus, nobody else is going to be there. You're going to stand before him individually on your own. And it's going to be a a discussion between you and him. So it's good for us to practice that future discussion right now (laughs) on this earth by just focusing on, Lord, help me to be clothed in you. Array me in your righteousness, in your character. Let the fruit of the Spirit be dripping off my vines. We are God's chosen people. May we be adorned in the spiritual clothing that demonstrates our calling as those who have chosen to follow Jesus and those who Jesus has chosen. Have a good look in the mirror and ask him, do I look good in this? (laughs) That's what Sean says. Um, Does this make me look fat? (laughs) We need to ask the Lord, how do I look? Or do I need some help? I'm putting on clothes that reflect your image, Jesus, in me. 
So how are you dressed today? Is there room for improvement in your wardrobe? I want to finish with this last scripture. 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Lord, we stand before you today. We stand before you today. We stand in front of you today, God, and ask you to put the mirror on us. And it's not in a way that's meant to shame us or humiliate us, God. This isn't between us and anybody else. This is between us and you. And Lord, I love when I look in the word and I sit in prayer and I look in the mirror, you point things out in me that got to go, that I need to take off. God, but you don't beat me up. You just teach me how to do it. You teach me how to strip off that old funky garment, and then you give me something to replace it. And so, Lord, I just I just ask this morning as we sit in your presence, God, would you reveal to each and every one of us out of that list of those seven attributes, I, I bet, God, that there's something that gouged each of our hearts this morning, God. And we want to exchange the old for the new. So this morning, if, if anything, if God was ministering to you about any one of these attributes that um, you know need development in your life, I just want you to stand to your feet this morning. And you don't have to yell out what it is. You don't have to be like, oh, I need help with patience or I need help with love or forgiveness. You don't have to do that. This is between you and God, but he's held up the mirror this morning. God, you are so faithful. You are so trustworthy. You are a good father. We don't need to be ashamed in your presence. God, we bring our brokenness and our failure to you, and you lovingly clothe us with righteousness. Through, through the, the blood of your son, Jesus, we receive that this morning. I just want you to hold your hands up this morning. Hallelujah. Lord, 